Good morning, afternoon, evening. My name is Nagla Riz. I am Professor of Economics and the Founding Director of the Access to Knowledge for Development Center at the American University in Cairo's School of Business. The title of um, my module today is uh, Artificial Intelligence, Inequality and Inclusion in the Middle East and North Africa, for short, AI, Inequality and Inclusion in MENA. Uh, the purpose of my talk is to highlight the challenges that await the adoption of AI and data in the region, but also the opportunities, rays of hope, and how we can capitalize on these for mitigating inequality and promoting inclusion. My talk is comprised of five sections. I will start by a brief background on the region, uh, the co context of, uh, of my, the narrative that I'd like to present. Then uh, I will talk a bit about AI in MENA, data infrastructure and people. I will highlight challenges, complexities and tensions, rays of hope, and then I will talk a bit about our work at the Access to Knowledge for Development Center. The region is by no means uh, homogeneous. It is a diverse region with variations in the level of uh, uh, resource richness and abundance of labor. So you find countries, for example, like Saudi Arabia and Libya that are resource rich, but uh, import their labor and countries like Egypt, my own country, Morocco and Jordan, for example, that are resource poor, but labor abundant. So uh, when we, and the impact of data, AI and technology are different depending on the context that we are studying. Nevertheless, the region uh, has a number of commonalities. Most importantly, it is a young region. There is a youth bulge. You have a youth population, the highest in the world, 60% are less than 25 years of age. So there is the future for you. And when you look at projections for 2050, more and more young people are expected to be part of the population. In fact, some numbers uh, between um, aged between 15 and 39 uh, youth, they comprise uh, more than 40% of the total uh, population. And in 2020, there were about 18 million more adults aged under 40 in the region than when the Arab Spring began. These numbers are important. When we look at uh, work, uh, the MENA region has the highest rates of globally of youth, the share of youth unemployment, uh, more than 27%. When we look at youth aged between 15, 24, not in employment, not in education, not in training, in 2019, they are among the highest in the world. In 2016, about 40% of university graduates in MENA were unemployed. Now, a look at uh, women, uh, the region uh, comprises the lowest rate of female labor participation globally and the highest rate of female unemployment globally. These numbers are important. Now, uh, when we look at informal economies, again, the, this is the share of informal work in total employment globally. The region has high percentages of informal workers ranging between 50 and 70%. As for poverty, you will find the poverty rates. This turquoise uh, line shows poverty rates. Yes, lower than some other parts uh, of the world. However, the rates have been increasing. And when we look at the chart in front of us, stopping at just before 2019, of course, after COVID and the Ukraine war, now we look at numbers of people living in extreme poverty, $5.5 a day at purchasing power parity. The numbers are increasing. And in 2019, the number was 176 million. 2021, more than 190 million. And the World Bank projects that with every increase in food and energy prices could raise the number of the poor by more than 20 million in the region. Egypt alone, the, the most recent poverty rate was almost 30%. As for inequality, again, there are high rates of inequality in the region. If you look at the MENA region, the, the top 10% of the population are actually have a share of almost 60% of the income. So we do have a, a region that is um, highly, uh, you know, that has high rates of the inequality, high rates of unemployment of the youth, women, and uh, the educated, and uh, high rates of poverty. Not only that, but inequality is multifaceted, complex, layered by income, gender, ethnicity, social background, education, health services, digital access and use, employment, 
living conditions, political participation, geography. It is inequality of opportunity, not just of wealth. For example, this is a picture uh, of a random picture of neighborhoods in, in Cairo. You have the contrast, the extremes from modern buildings to uh, you know, a low cost, you know, informal housing actually slums. And you see similar pictures uh, actually in countries like Saudi Arabia, which are supposed to be the richer countries of the region. As for technology, let's take a look. The MENA region, uh, uh, this is the inter number of internet users as percentage of the population. Yes, there has been an increase. Yes, it's higher than other parts uh, of the world, but a closer look will also show us that this is more for richer countries of the region, the Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Oman, as for the, in comparison to the rest of the countries. So there is a digital divide between countries of the region, not just within. Of, again, looking at mobile cellular subscriptions, you will find the MENA region doing relatively well globally, indeed higher than world averages, but these numbers are also mostly for the richer countries of the region, as you see on this diagram. So we also have a digital divide between and within countries by income, by age, by gender, education, and geography. And this is the context where technology comes in. Now, as well, a word on uh, freedoms in the MENA region. If you look at indices of uh, economic freedom, you will find that the region relatively fares better than world averages as far as economic freedoms are concerned. And this is mostly coming, again, from the richer countries of the region, the Gulf countries, the resource abundant. And this comes in comparison to uh, what the region, uh, looking at uh, um, indices of democracy and political participation, you will find the region doing uh, much less than world averages. This contrast between economic freedoms and civil liberties was highlighted as early as 2010. I had the good fortune to be a contributor to this report 2009. And one of the conclusions of this report was that a change in the actual situation of freedoms in the region in recent years had, has been confined to an improvement in economic freedoms, an analogous improvement in political and intellectual freedoms, democratic pursuits and freedom of expression has not occurred, occurred in most Arab countries. That was published in 2009. And of course, we, we know the result, the failure of trickle down and the rest is history, no pun intended, the Arab Spring taking place in 2011. At that time, about 250 million people out of the 400 million or two thirds of the population were classified as poor or vulnerable. So uh, this is what happened. This is the context and th the context is important. Context matters when you look at technology. We all know that technology has the impact of, uh, you know, exacerbating inequalities, marginalizing, but it can also be turned around for the pursuit of inclusion and for mitigating, but also overcoming these inequalities and for promoting and advancing inclusion and development. So let's take a look at AI in MENA. Let's take a look at data, infrastructure, and people. Now, uh, first data, of course, is the mine. You know, there is, it's, uh, you know, what we see in the region are a number of observations. First, what I call the data lock by the state, because in, in many cases, data is not open. Data is uh, behind barriers. Barriers could be political, could be uh, technical. It is not available in, in usable uh, format. Uh, as well, uh, you can have also a data asymmetry, inequality between uh, the owners of data, of course, large multinationals, as opposed to young homegrown uh, businesses. Uh, within the different countries of the region. And of course, data is power. And um, this presents a barrier against small uh, companies. Sometimes data is owned by large, even national uh, corporations, not necessarily multinational. And in that sense, it presents a barrier against small uh, companies. In one interview I had during my research on the subject, uh, it was clearly stated that health data in particular, and that was before COVID, by the way, that big labs sit on a wealth of health data that if only made available, of course, following uh, the data protection, the, the proper uh, legal landscape, this would create tremendous entrepreneurship opportunities for young businesses, but also would improve healthcare 
for uh, citizens. In fact, the court said that it would uh, anticipate uh, pandemics, or actually the word was epidemics. It was before COVID. And this is quoted in my uh, research. So uh, we do have data challenges in the region. Uh, then what I call is the data inaccuracy, a blur. You know, you'll find data, there is a blur in data because for, for, many, for a number of reasons, the data may not reflect the reality on the ground. And invisibilities in data or data blurs will result in invisibility of communities from national policy making. For example, people living in uh, informal housing uh, that are not part of the urban planning schemes, that are not properly documented. We, I mentioned earlier informal workers that are not part of the uh, national data landscape will just be also invisible to national policy making and social protection. So these are images from housing uh, in Cairo, uh, one third of housing in Cairo. Of course, we have modern buildings, but we do have one third of our housing are informal. Uh, we also have in Morocco, for example, to a, a percentage of 23% and also in Lebanon. These communities exist in different parts of the region. And if they are not properly seen and documented in data, they will be outside of the radar of national policy making as well. One of the problems is what I call data myopia in the sense that using indicators that are top down, that do not really see reality, they do not properly assess reality on the ground. And so the result is just a very uh, myopic view of the reality. So this translates to uh, policies that are not accurate and that do not reflect what is happening uh, on the ground and the policies that do not address the needs of the people. Uh, again, using the Gini coefficient as an example is a failure. And again, I cite the Arab Spring because the indices at the time were, you know, high rates of economic growth. Uh, the, the, the numbers were measuring uh, income in, in the countries of, you know, uh, Egypt and, and Tunisia and the others. And clearly, this was a failure of data as well because the reality, the, inequ the real inequality was not properly captured using the metrics or the statistics that are the formal ones that are usually des designed in an office and do not take, are not creative enough to capture what is happening uh, on the ground. When we look at the infrastructure, we look at uh, data storage and computing. That's another divide because there is an uneven access to data storage facilities between countries and within countries. It's also related to the digital divide. And even access to computing capacity, limited internet connectivity, all of this will affect the ability of adoption of the technologies. Uh, again, uh, even use of the cloud, uh, there are the threats of being restricted to a specific vendor, of data being, uh, some, some uh, people are skeptic of their data being stored with a specific uh, vendor. And again, the weak power, uh, weak infrastructure is itself a challenge and can cause more regional digital inequalities with companies moving to uh, either richer countries of the region or relocating uh, completely in Europe or uh, elsewhere in the global north. So these are issues that affect the adoption of um, of AI in the region. The data issues are, are challenging. The infrastructure is challenging, but what about the people? You know, uh, again, who designs the technology? Who owns the technology? Who benefits? Who designs the algorithm? You know, where are the, the beneficiaries of AI? Uh, you know, there are black boxes, the technologies, are they black boxes within black boxes and people do not have agency or ownership of what is going on there? Uh, you know, who writes the algorithm? Are they ready-made algorithms? What data is being used? So again, this, this can challenge and amplify biases that can create, cause and create harmful consequences, especially to marginalized group. So uh, again, this is a problem in, in between the biases in inaccuracy of the data, the invisibility, the blur, biases in algorithms, all of this can cause allocative harms especially if they're decontextualized and, and uh, lacking the community and the domain experts. What about work? Uh, people talk about jobs lost, jobs gained. Uh, again, the skill structure is integral here of the region, and we have seen statistics on unemployment of the university educated. So there is definitely a need for upskilling for these graduates for skills of the future. There is a gap, a clear gap there. And uh, a, a very good example is call centers. 
In Egypt, for example, it was known for uh, providing work opportunities for its youth they, who are typically graduates of universities and have uh, skilled with languages. Now, if this is going to be replaced by AI, these young men and women are going to be out of work and it has started already. So upskilling is very, very important. I also um, use the word cross-skilling because we need to skill between specializations and domains and technologies. So uh, tech, data scientists and, and technologists should also, if they are uh, working in the health field, they need to understand about the, the, the dimensions of the health sector, but also people in the health sector need to learn the technology. So uh, this is what I mean by cross-skilling. Again, for in order to be able to gain new jobs and not be outside you know, the, the labor market. Of course, there is a challenge of retention and brain drain, and this is a real problem on the ground. I have interviewed uh, startups in this field and they have a challenge uh, holding on to their human capital. Uh, uh, what happens is that, uh, you know, uh, there is a brain drain either to the richer countries of the region, typically the, the United Arab Emirates, or to uh, the global north. Uh, then, of course, there's a whole discussion about new forms of work, gig work, cloud work, the challenges there of precarious work, uh, the idea here of, of you know, uh, workers being, uh, are not employed employees and hence lack the benefits and the protection. But the, the irony uh, is that uh, um, given the, the demographics that I spoke about earlier, you can see that uh, these, this kind of work offers indeed opportunities, especially for cloud work that requires higher skills and especially for these uh, workers gaining foreign currency. Uh, because there's a clear foreign, I mean, at least in Egypt and Lebanon, there's a very clear foreign currency shortage in the economy. So even with all the challenges that gig work, uh, you know, on the ground and on the cloud uh, includes, it still can offer opportunities. So then the challenge becomes, or the, the, the hope becomes, how can we have fair work practices in this form of work in a way to make it actually, uh, you know, to capitalize on it for uh, opportunities for the youth and for uh, the women, a uh, raise of hope. Uh, so I have outlined the challenges. Raise of hope is that the startup scene has picked up pretty well in the region. There's, uh, you know, clear signs of active youth and women entrepreneurship, novel data collection methodologies, data-driven innovation, and some government uh, initiatives. A startup scene in MENA here, for example, of course, United Arab Emirates tops uh, the list. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, Saudi Arabia, but Egypt has been doing well. Jordan, Bahrain. Then uh, also, uh, so increasing uh, rates of, of uh, startups in the area. Egypt, in particular, has had a record high uh, in, in 2021 in the VC deals and venture. Uh, funding, uh, local startups have raised quite decent amounts of money. So this is, offers a great uh, ray of hope uh, for the region. Another hopeful sign is novel data collection methodologies, crowdsourcing, data-driven innovation. HarassMap is an initiative where uh, for the crowdsourcing for, uh, you know, supporting women using technology to support women and protect them from uh, harassment. Uh, Biolak is another uh, also a start local startup homegrown uh, for monitoring traffic in Egypt. Uh, life is short to spend stuck in traffic. Cairo traffic is quite uh, famous. Uh, so these are the, based on crowd sourcing data and they offer uh, solutions. Also uh, a positive sign, some governments have taken uh, steps to uh, you know, adopt uh, AI and to have strategies. Uh, so the countries on the map are countries that do have AI strategies, including Egypt, which I was fortunate enough to contribute to. And uh, these are uh, positive steps that are welcome. Uh, and then uh, this chart has, um, you know, sort of a summary of the environment around data. Uh, it still leaves, uh, you know, um, quite a bit to be desired, especially in the adoption of open government uh, partnership. We have only three countries in the region. Data protection, there are some steps uh, when, you know, the circle that has those little teeth, this is a, sort of a draft law in, in Jordan. So you have some countries who do have data protection laws, right to privacy, not all the countries, but there are steps that are taking place. We still have quite a bit uh, to go. Again, with open free and open source software in Egypt, again, I was fortunate enough to draft the strategy for Egypt um, uh, in, in 20, that was announced in 2014. So 
There are steps, but then there's a lot to be desired, especially given the data lock by the state. Uh, more tensions and complexities. Uh, the discourse over AI and inequality in the region is intertwined with, its, with the region's unique political, economic, and social context. That's why I spent time looking at this. The political economy of, of inclusion is very, very important in this part of the region, especially in light of its unique demographics. The dynamics of AI and its impact on inclusion or inequality are embedded in these uh, complexities. So specifically, there are three tensions that shape the debate. First, the technology paradox. I mentioned it earlier. We all know that technology can lead to severe inequalities and exacerbating and marginalization. And so sort of leading away from the center, you know, centrifugal forces, but it can also bring centripetal towards the center, include, bring everyone in, you know, take steps to uh, for inclusion. And here is actually the challenge then becomes how can we, can AI serve uh, uh, these, you know, uh, these trends? How can we use them to uh, encourage inclusion and definitely not only mitigate inequalities or marginalization, but overcome them and transform the, the situation in a way that can promote inclusion. I mentioned economic versus political freedoms, and this is again another tension. And this can, you know, we need to underline the gap. Uh, there and to make sure that we use uh, the technology to for inclusion and for encouraging uh, expression and civil uh, liberties. And then there is also the threat of technological determinism, the idea that once we, uh, you know, uh, invest in technology, it's uh, technology is, uh, you know, a magic wand, it's uh, the panacea, we should, uh, you know, know that it's only, it may be necessary, but not sufficient. So, Awareness of these tensions are important in uh, uh, understanding and, and addressing the, the dynamics and making use of AI for inclusion uh, in the MENA uh, region. So basically, uh, if the, you want to stay away from a top-down approach that focuses on, on, on technologies that are not appropriate or that actually further marginalize the, the underprivileged, uh, and we want to be aware of, the, of these threats and to make every effort to actually invest in appropriate technologies that promote inclusion and not uh, marginalization. If you will allow me, I'll say a few words about our work at the Access to Knowledge for Development Center. It is a multi, uh, uh, multi uh, <coughs> excuse me, multidisciplinary research. We are uh, based at the School of Business and we work with stakeholders uh, from all over the world, uh, and locally, regionally, and internationally on transformational research, evidence-based research, advocacy to impact policy locally, and also to present the voice of the region uh, in the global arena on these issues. These are my colleagues. This is my team uh, at the center at the moment. We happen to be an all-women team uh, at the moment. Uh, and uh, basically, we have a number of activities. I will just uh, outline them. So we have uh, the Fair Work Project in partnership with the Fair Work Network at Oxford Internet Institute. And we look at fair work practices in the ground gig uh, economy and how we can improve uh, the conditions, work with platforms to improve the livelihood of workers and use uh, this as an opportunity and, and uh, mitigate the challenges so that workers are able to have decent work. Um, we have another project, a regional project uh, called New Work Data and Inclusion in the Digital Economy. We lead a regional research initiative looking at not only gig workers as in the Fair Work Project, but also we look at cloud workers. And this includes countries in other parts of, in other countries of the region, as I will show you shortly uh, on the map. We have another project called Governing Responsible Data and AI in the MENA region and here we are working with Birzeit in, in Palestine, Birzeit University. We lead the research track in uh, different countries of the region looking at governance of data and AI, responsible data and AI in the MENA region. We are creating an observatory for that work that I will share with you in a minute. We are also the MENA hub for the a Alliance, the Feminist AI Research Network, uh, looking at transformational AI uh, to uh, overcome uh, inequalities, marginalization, and actually change the design of AI and be uh, you know, for inclusion of uh, women and other marginalized groups. We've, we do research on women and work informality in the post-COVID-19 digital economy uh, and beyond in Egypt. 
And last but not least, at the moment, we are engaged as part, we are the North African hub of the Open African Innovation Research Network, where um, uh, we lead the research on uh, alternative innovation metrics. The idea, what I mentioned earlier about indices, uh, looking at, you know, being assessed based on practices on the ground. So we try to look at innovation in Africa, not only through, uh, you know, uh, uh, the sort of well-known indices, uh, mainstream indices, but we try to also create alternative indices that capture the innovation that takes place in Africa to provide accurate data on African innovation. A bit more detail, for examples, um, as I mentioned, governance of responsible data and AI in MENA. At the moment, we're leading a, a research track on governance of health data and AI in MENA region, in Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, and uh, Lebanon. Uh, then our next uh, research track will be uh, food security. Both tracks are super uh, urgent at this uh, juncture in, in the, for the MENA uh, region. And as I mentioned earlier, we are creating the MENA AI Observatory, which will be launched pretty soon. And I will make sure uh, to announce that for everyone so you can join the launch. Uh, so uh, this is uh, with the support of IDRC and in partnership with Birzeit uh, University. Uh, we're also, as I mentioned, the MENA hub for feminist AI uh, research and examples. We are uh, working with researchers in Jordan uh, on a project to uh, looking at responsible algorithmic decision making to correct for biases in credit scoring for uh, microfinance. Um, uh, in, in Jordan, as I mentioned, and in Egypt, we, are, we have also a fantastic research team who's uh, also a proposed a study that we are we're working with them on that, on explainable AI-based tutoring system for Upper Egypt community schools and girls in this part of the world. It is their research, and our role as the hub is to work with them, um, you know, have a research that becomes also um, hopefully uh, a prototype and pilot. Uh, this is the research on new work, data and inclusion in the digital economy, a main perspective uh, in, with support from Ford Foundation. Again, we're working with partners in Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan and Lebanon, looking at um, a with specific case study in every country, looking at uh, fair work practices and other ways of inclusion of gig work and or cloud workers uh, in the region in their respective countries. And we are doing our own study here in Egypt. Uh, this is the research on fair work in the gig economy. Uh, we have uh, done two uh, consecutive years, two studies for uh, Egypt, and we are very proud of the impact of the work when sometimes the same platform, the, this research scores the fair work practices in uh, the different platforms. And we're very happy to see platforms working with us from one year to the next and their score improves because of the improving their practices with the workers as we collaborate together. And this is a win-win situation for everyone because this is also a fantastic opportunity for entrepreneurship for these uh, platforms, for, the for these startups who actually end up uh, being part of the dynamic uh, startup scene and business entrepreneurship scene in, in Egypt. And we also did a study on a regional study on, on, uh, on practices, fair work practices in the domestic service sector that is also based on the gig work uh, model. Very uh, quick examples. This is Egypt's AI strategy. And again, I, as I mentioned, very proud to have contributed to that. And this is uh, thanks to the wonderful work that my team, uh, you know, uh, takes in, in collaboration with other partners uh, in Egypt and elsewhere. So I'm very proud to be on the technical committee of the National Council. Egypt's AI uh, policy, and this is really an opportunity to, uh, you know, bring in what we, uh, you know, what we're trying to achieve. Again, our work on Uber uh, ride-hailing study was was quoted in uh, the the National Gazette when the ride-hailing uh, act was uh, issued in Egypt, in uh, sort of to improve the conditions of the Uber uh, drivers. Uh, then again, this is the National Free and Open Source Software Strategy in Egypt announced in. Uh, 2014. Uh, examples of our global networks, uh, you know, as I mentioned, open air, data for development, copyright access, a Harvard Law School course that I teach at AUC, of course, the global network of internet and society research center, access to knowledge global academy, the fair work network. 
and uh, examples of global partners. I will not re read the names, but just to give you a, an idea of the different partners that we have in the region, in Africa and, and globally. We're very proud partners of each and every one of them. Um, one example of global activities that is very close to my heart is being part of the executive committee of the Global Symposium on AI and Inclusion in Rio de Janeiro with, uh, with ITS and uh, the, uh, the network of centers. It was November 2017. And you know, I zoomed in and there I am in that little picture with wonderful partners from all over the globe. And I think that was also a very good educational exercise for me. Uh, very quickly, our contributions to global uh, publications. In fact, I, the chapter on AI and inequality in the MENA region at the very center of this slide is the base for, um, for this talk. Uh, you know, with, of course, this was published in 2020, so I have updates for you today and, and you know, plenty of other stuff. And then participating in uh, the Peace Paris Forums report that came out uh, earlier uh, in March of last year participating in the state of open data, writing the MENA chapter, and then an update again that's coming out very soon. Uh, you know, a number of uh, gender data and evidence in gender equality, again, writing the MENA chapter here, uh, doing research on, on women drivers in right sharing, doing the chapter on who owns the media in the, in the MENA region as part of the, the book by uh, Professor Norm, and this is just a, you know, a number of publications that we have on this uh, topic. Uh, I guess in the end, uh, the final word that I want to say is that um, at the Access to Knowledge for Development, what we really believe in is the role of knowledge technology for development, hence our, it's our namesake. So uh, with all the changes that are happening around us, it is very important to be very conscious of the ethics of AI and to make sure that we use the technologies as uh, the technology as transformational, making sure that we uh, mitigate inequalities, not only mitigate them, but also overcome them and advance inclusion in MENA for uh, everyone, not only the marginalized, but for everyone in this uh, region that has very unique demographic and uh, you know uh, labor market characteristics. Thank you very much. <laughs>